uh, I wanted to start by thanking Bits again for having me and for hosting these meetings every year. It really is a great intellectual home for those of us who do this work. And today I'm going to be talking about what role institutional review boards might have uh, in the open science movement, um, thinking about it from actually their perspective um, as a focus. I want to start by just some acknowledgments and declarations. My core collaborator on this is Casey Bowskill at RAND. We're grateful to the Robert Wood Johnson for funding this project. And in terms of relevant honor honoraria, I've uh, taught about ethical research at the BITS training and recently gave a talk to US OPRE that involves some discussion on this topic. So wanted to acknowledge those. And so in terms of the framing, I think um, I'm coming more from a perspective of institutionalizing open science at universities, particularly research intensive universities, and then seeing where IRBs fit in that. So I really see the university as the unit of intervention. And I think this is part of the growing popularity of systems approaches to calibrating the scientific ecosystem towards openness and reproducibility. Um, and if you think about from a behavioral science intervention perspective, uh, intervention design perspective, uh, the best frameworks out there, at least the most prominent ones, talk about considering all potentially relevant behaviors of all relevant stakeholders. And I think rightfully so, initiatives targeting universities have heavily focused uh, to date on hiring, promotion, and tenure practices, and there's some great papers looking at this. But I think that in addition, the policies, procedures, and resources of research offices at universities and research institutions are another place to intervene. And my colleague Evan Mayo Wilson has done a great project that we're somewhat uh, mimicking here, looking at PRS administrators, which are the, the folks who are in charge of making sure applicable clinical trials are registered and reported on time. Um, so for those of you, if you're fans of The Office and think of that episode where Toby comes back and Michael Scott is going, God, no, why? Uh, and you're wondering, why IRBs? Because I know that there are some who have uh, adversarial relationships, is one way to put it, with their IRBs at their institutions. I think there are a few reasons why we should think about what role they should have and to engage them um, rather than just kind of let the chips fall as they may. One is that IRVs can influence investigators' ability to practice open science in their human subjects research, particularly data sharing. And Michelle Meyer has this great piece on tips for ethical data sharing. And at least in some fields and at some institutions, there are templates of IRBs where it says, we will destroy the data. And if that's what gets signed, you face a lot of difficulties if you want to share that data down the road. I think thinking about it the other way and you know, appreciating that um, other folks besides researchers at our research institutions are our colleagues and professionals, um, IRBs will be impacted if the open science movement is successful. And one way to think about this is you get more people who are sharing data and data sharing in itself can risk the level of review. So if you have a prior proportion of studies that are elevated review, that's going to take more time and resources for our colleagues at our institutions. And one also has to think, if it's people who are new to data sharing, are they potentially going to propose things that are risky? And if you don't kind of prevent that kind of risky proposal up front, I think there might be some uh, sewing down the cogs in the wheel at our research institutions uh, down the road that, as a prevention scientist, have been one of the things that motivate me to think about this issue. And then lastly, uh, some folks, particularly in the medical and clinical trials literature, have written pieces on IRB review as an opportunity to intervene early in the research life cycle, knowing that quite a lot, like reporting guidelines, are at the end of the road. And this is a spot where all human subjects research goes through a common point at research institutions. And so maybe it's worthwhile to think about what role they might have, if any, uh, to influence researchers to consider open science practices. And if nothing else, Robert Wood Johnson had what roles do IRBs have in the open science movement as one of their priorities for the grant call. So we figured, what the hell, that sounds like an interesting question. We'll, we'll tackle that. So our aim, and as an intervention researcher by training, uh, was doing some exploratory empirical research to potentially inform intervention development, systems, behavior change down the road. Um, so my mind implicitly thinks about something called the Medical Research uh, Council framework in the UK that is really influential for the development of complex interventions in public health. And we're sort of at this initial stage of identifying or developing theory, perhaps lowercase theory, and modeling the processes and outcomes of the problem to then think about uh, interventions down the road that correspond to the causes of issues. So what did we do? Um, today I'm going to talk about um, some results for the first time actually, uh, preliminary results from a survey and interview that we've done, a mixed method study. Our sampling frame were the 253 universities classified by Carnegie as R1 or R2, so research intensive or highly research intensive, that also had an IRB that was actively registered at the Office of Human Research Protections, which is the office in 
Health and Human Services that monitors compliance and uh, issues authoritative guidance on meeting regulations. The survey questions that we have are based on an analysis of official ethical principles and regulations, um, i.e. conceptualizing IRBs really principally as compliance offices. Um, and one of the things that we talk about in an opinion piece uh, that I'll show in the references is, while it's, I think, fair to say, of course, that IRBs care about the, the ethical, the scientific, the moral charges of this uh, line of work, principally their job is to make sure that research avoids non-compliance with certain regulations. And we thought it would be useful to ask them questions that demonstrate a knowledge of the regulations that they see the research world through. So we asked questions related to the relevance of open science to some of these regulations, as well as com questions about their policies, procedures, guidance they give to investigators, informed consent templates, expertise that they have, and the role of organizations that provide oversight to IRBs and where open science fits here. And then we followed up with the subsample of our survey sample, and we based the interview protocol, the questions we were asking, on something called the theoretical domains framework. And this is uh, a framework that helps implementation scientists who try to change the behavior of healthcare professionals, by and large, to identify facilitators and barriers to enact behaviors based on their capability, their motivation, and their opportunity to commit a behavior. So think about your standard law and order cop drama, you know, means, motive, and opportunity to do something. That's basically what this framework is based on. Um, so I'm gonna go through this somewhat quickly, but happy to answer follow-up questions now or later about more details about the study. But in terms of the participants who we recruited, we uh, recruited about half, a little over half, of the IRB organizations in the US that met our criteria for the survey. And then about a quarter of those did the interview. Uh, they were predominantly the chairs of their IRBs. Uh, the majority are not certified professionals. So they don't have the certification in this space, and that may be because they're chairs, and certification is more common amongst the staff, the administrative staff at IRBs. Most IRBs use an electronic rather than a paper and pencil system to track their submissions. Uh, the majority evaluate applicable clinical trials, and that's important because there are some regulations related to clinical trials that we're seeing clinical trials offices at universities collaborate more extensively and explicitly with human subjects offices. So that might influence their answers to some of the questions. And about half of the survey respondents are accredited by the accreditation program in this area. Only a, a third of the interview were, so that might be something to disentangle um, in sort of subgroup analyses, if you will, or, um, or as we disentangle the results from our interviews. Um, so now going into the questions that we asked, um, we first asked about their perceptions of the relevance of open science practices to official ethical principles that they might use to guide decisions about IRB approval. Um, the first set of principles are from the Declaration of Helsinki, which is the World Medical Association's ethical principles for human subjects research. So not something that officially guides uh, US IRB's decision making, but they have two items in this declaration that we thought were really interesting to ask about because they explicitly touch on open science practices, namely whether every research study involving human subjects, and they say every research study, not just clinical trials, must be registered in a publicly accessible database before recruitment of the first subject. And then another verbatim principle is researchers have an ethical obligation to make publicly available the results of their research on human subjects. In terms of the Belmont Report, which is the official policy of principles of the Department of Health and Human Services, um, there were a few items there that we thought were particularly relevant to open science. Namely, one, an informed consent whether they think investigators have an obligation to make sure subjects adequately comprehend risk of breaches and confidentiality, which has been a huge focus of the revised common rule that came into effect earlier this year. And then when results of research study are not publicly available, do they think that benefits to society in the form of generalizable knowledge to be gained are lost? And whether the lack of results being publicly available impairs an IRB's ability to accurately estimate the probability of harm or benefit of a future study in that area, which is explicitly something that they're tasked to do. And then the last is regards to the principle of justice, and this is whether publicly funded research should be made publicly available in as open a manner as possible. So what we found is that the vast majority of respondents, about 95%, somewhat or strongly agreed that um, 
investigators have an obligation to make sure subjects understand the risks of re-identification if de-identified data is being shared. And about 80% somewhat are strongly agreed that the products of publicly funded research should be made publicly and available in as open a manner as possible. About 80% Likewise thought that benefits to society are lost when investigators do not make the results of the research publicly available, and that researchers have an ethical obligation to make publicly available the results of the research on human subjects. Fewer, about 63%, somewhat are strongly agreed that um, lack of public results influences IRB's ability to accurately estimate the probability of harm or benefit of future studies in that research area. And my personal hypothesis based on the interviews is whether IRBs are actually looking at systematic reviews of all of the studies for every study. And so is this really something that's explicitly done or is it something nominal that um, they rely on what an investigator reports to them when they justify the risk level of certain procedures? And then most, about 58%, somewhat or strongly agree disagreed that every research study involving human subjects must be registered in a publicly accessible database. So a bit of variation depending on which item, and I think there was quite a lot of agreement with uh, items that were explicitly mentioned in the Belmont principles. So now we wanted to look at how that actually translates into their procedures for assessing proposed use at study submission, verifying use when a study is done, and generally looking at the history of using open science practices. So the first is relevant to put the particular codes of the federal regulations for those who are interested, whether uh, they ask investigators explicitly to describe whether they plan to use an open science practice. The second is among the IRBs that do ask about these practices, do they actually verify that these plans are followed? And we leave it open to them to interpret what verify means, and I think that's a question for future inquiry. And the last is whether they consider an investigator's history of implementing these practices in previous studies when they review a new study submission, which is something that has been mentioned in some editorials in this space of the medical literature. So we thought, let's see what these folks actually think about that. Um, so while most respondents work at IRBs that don't explicitly ask investigators to describe whether they plan to share their protocol, their code, or their materials, most do explicitly ask investigators to describe whether they plan to share their data, register their studies, and publicly release aggregate study results for some or all new study submissions. And I think we'll see a theme where it seems like the open science practices that IRB members themselves see most relevant to the work that they do is data sharing, making sure the results get out there, and most likely for clinical trials that they are registered. But for those that do explicitly ask investigators to describe these plans, um, most systematically verify that investigators have actually registered studies for some or all new submissions. Again, I imagine that's for clinical trials, though most do not systematically verify essentially all of the other open science practices. So it leaves this question open of, at continuing review and as the study is happening, is this something that IRBs should and can do, or is this something that another actor in the ecosystem should take on board, especially with increasing concerns about IRB mission and scope creep? And then lastly, the vast majority of respondents reported that their IRB does not consider an investigator's history of actually implementing open science practices in previous studies when their IRB reviews a new study submission from that investigator. So this is just something looking at that proposal from the medical literature that currently is not a common practice. The next thing we wanted to look at was whether they provide guidance and templates on specific open science practices that are explicitly mentioned in regulations for what IRBs are supposed to do. And the four or five that we focused on were whether they provide investigators guidance on how to record information so that identity cannot be readily ascertained, which is a requirement for an exempt research study. Non-exempt research is a requirement to share data with adequate provisions to protect privacy and confidentiality, so do they give investigators that kind of explicit guidance. Um, whether there is informed content, uh, consent templates that talk about language to which confidentiality will be maintained, as well as future use of DFI identified data. And then lastly, for the, the institutions that have chosen to implement the new broad consent category, um, do they have an example broad consent form as an alternative to traditional informed consent for their investigators. And so what we found is that only 25% of respondents reported that their IRB does allow investigators to use broad consent, but of this 
the vast majority, about 84, do have a written example that they can use. The vast majority of respondents reported that their IRB does provide templates of informed consent forms that contain language for um, using or distributing collected information for future research studies and to share data. Though a question I wish I had added in hindsight that didn't is do they also have a template that says you can destroy your data, which is something that comes up quite a lot. And the vast majority reported that their IRB does provide investigators with written guidance relevant to recording information in a manner compliant with criteria for exempt and non-exempt research. So I think signs of hope there. And so for those who don't have these guidance, can they get it from their colleagues? And then I think another area of follow-up is actually asking for copies of this guidance and see what it actually says. Uh, another area we looked at was the membership and consultants with expertise in open science practice that are engaged by IRBs. And three areas that are explicitly mentioned in the regulations we were curious about were experts in essentially data matching and re-identification. Again, this was a huge component of the revision to the common rule. There's a particular call to have representation of those who have expertise and sensitivity to community attitudes. And when we went to the IRB professional conference, there was a lot of work asking about whether subjects are aware of things like data sharing and re-identification. And then lastly, uh, whether there's someone who's either an expert uh, member or a consultant with the IRB who is knowledgeable about regulations for registering and reporting clinical trials. The mo most respondents did work in an IRB with either a primary or alternate board member who has expertise in ct.gov clinical trial registration requirements, but most did not work in an IRB with a board member who has expertise in identifiability of private information in biospecimen or community attitudes towards data sharing. And we see basically the same kind of pattern toward those two open science practices in terms for consultants that IRBs have on hand. So for those who are keen, one thing to think about if you really want to make change to your institution and you have this expertise, get in touch with your IRB. They kind of are looking for it. And then the last thing in the survey I wanted to mention was their views on the relevance of open science to OHRP oversight of IRB work. AAHRPP accreditation of programs, and primer certification of individual IRB professionals. And most respondents, in line with some of the views about the relevance of open science, thought it would be critical for OHRP to develop guidance for IRBs on data sharing and public release of aggregate study results specifically, while for the rest, they thought it was important but not critical or not important for them to develop this guidance for other practices. And in addition, for both accreditation and for certification and competencies, uh, the majority did not think this was critical to incorporate there. So I think a first starting point is OHRP guidance, which really influences IRB behavior. Uh, a quick summary of the qualitative results. Um, some considerations for trying to implement some sort of open science related uh, intervention that involves IRBs. First, looking at the motivation to enact a behavior. Uh, a theme was that IRB professionals are more likely to engage with open science practices that fit their role or identity as an IRB professional. I think this has to do with both whether they self-perceive that this is something and whether others at their institution perceive that this is in their lane. And in particular, there was a lot of fear of pushback from researchers. So for what it's worth, that adversarial relationship is perspective the other way around. Um, in terms of opportunity to enact a behavior, they're more likely, again, to engage with these practices if recommended by key organizations. And OHRP, the Office of Human Research Protections, was a big one. And they're more likely to engage with practices if they're supported by professional peers. And two main groups that came up a lot were other IRB offices, particularly in the same regional area. It seems like they're informal regional networks where they share best practices with each other and then other faculty and researchers at their institution. What we think actually does, believe it or not, influence on the whole, at least those in our interview, uh, their behaviors as IRB professionals. And then lastly, when we're talking about capability, one of the things that came up is that for checking the quality of some of this work, they actually believed that other professionals at the university might have more expertise from a scientific standpoint to look at open science practices but that they felt capable of checking their compliance with the human subjects regulations. And at a lot of institutions, IRBs coordinate a lot of the regulatory reviews. They felt capable, if an institution found it palatable, to coordinate this kind of scientific research compliance oversight looking at open science practices. 
So in some, some potential future directions, uh, look to see if OHRB might be interested in developing guidance on the role of IRBs in so open science. And I think this involves recommendations for and against certain policies and procedures of what maybe they should and shouldn't do. For universities to establish policies on the role their IRB has in the context of their institutional ecosystem, and by which I mean it's important to gauge multiple stakeholders at the university, particularly faculty, and then other research offices, particularly research compliance offices. And then lastly, to use formal approaches to intervention development to perhaps design education and training for IRB professionals based on the policies at OHRP and their university's institute that enable this kind of work. And I think we'll hear more about intervention design in a second. So these are the references in case anyone was interested who I've cited. Thank you for your time. I look forward to the conversation. Clarifying question. Sean, a quick question on open science and the IRBs themselves. Uh, did you guys ever hear or thought of asking about them publishing the protocols in a consistent and open fashion, maybe with an embargo because that might buy some things? For the IRBs to publish the protocol? Yeah. Um, we didn't explicitly in either the survey and the interview. And one of the reasons that we didn't is an informal sort of pilot work for designing the survey and engaging with professionals, particularly at Primer. Um, I think there was quite my anecdotal response would be there's a bit of a fear that researchers think that that's scope creep, having them publish their protocols publicly. That's a researcher call and isn't mentioned in the regulations. Um, but it's something that has been proposed as well as the fact that at an institution, IRBs have a good record of all of the studies that have been proposed. So there's a, a denominator there that if an institution and faculty and IRBs felt like they had the support to make that public, maybe OHRP, my, my harebrained idea is OHRP, could you create a database of all the studies that have been proposed? Because I mean, this is something that comes across when in, in the checking that we do, although it's not entirely in scope for a data editor, it is something we do is that, is there actually mention of an IRB protocol? And sometimes it's as vague as, yep, we have it. And other times it has a number, but I have, nobody has any means of checking whether that's actually an actual existing protocol. Right. I think it's a great question. I think um, thinking about the wider ecosystem, if we have influential journals or researchers in an area, pushing that feedback, maybe start at your institution, but then disseminate that to others, that is something that would be more likely to tip the scales for someone to try that out. I'll let you try first. <laughs> Uh, well, so let's save the more difficult questions for later. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Next up, we have uh, Micah Altman, who's the head of research and lead scientist for the program of, on information science at MIT Libraries. Hi. Um, hello, hello. Good. So uh, this is joint work with Philip Cohen, who's um, in the Department of Sociology at University of Maryland, and Jessica Polka, uh, ASAP Bio, that's for Google. Um, there's a standard disclaimer, which is essentially anything, if you like anything I say, uh, then credit is due to my collaborators. And if you don't like anything I say, I got it wrong. They had not, they're not on the hook for this. Um, I would also like to issue a, a slightly different disclaimer, um, giving this, one is that this is aspirational. Uh, giving this talk reminds me of, of 20 plus years ago doing the first negative replication and realizing as I was, was presenting it that forever after I was going to have to include a replication file with every paper that I created. Um, and I, I'm getting, this has happened at other times and I'm getting a similar feeling. I'll say that 
I am director of research at, at CREOS, Center for Research and Equitable Open Scholarship. I'm an information scientist and, and computational social scientist. My colleagues are uh, biochemists at, and, um, and observational social scientists. We don't do, the, we're not trained in doing these interventions. Um, we have done a lot of open niche science stuff from creating data citations, digital preservation systems, statistical software sensitivity analysis, preprint servers, citizen science platforms, the credit, credit taxonomies, or, or could ident or research for identifiers, et cetera. Uh, and if you ask me like what, to, what, what the effect of those are in it and to defend it really rigorously, I don't think I can. Though I think they all worked. So there's a challenge, the stakes are getting high, and there's a challenge uh, of reacting to the to continuous gaps and flaws that we see. And one, a, a recent paper struck us, and we, we select this paper for just as a, a provocation, not because it's bad, but because we like it. Um, it's got its limits, but it's, you know, the limits are understandable and it works well within those. Basically, the finding from Huspedo et al. is that for looking at three conferences in economics in Europe, that there is a bias against female authored papers. That doing some regression models, this is observational, doing some regression models, trying to control for paper quality, other factors, what, what dis domination of the discipline, um, that female authors rate male and female papers equally with respect to quality, predicting quality outcomes, and male, male panels tend to um, underrate female author papers. So what might we do? They, the authors propose an intervention of requiring review panels to be mixed gender. There are other, just based on Twitter, consult um, other, other suggestions in their paper, uh, consulting with grad students. Um, there are a number of interventions that came from mind. Um, one, one more straightforward, the most straightforward design for that particular problem, that all female papers are, are biased, to get, are, are not reviewed well by all female, by all male panels, is to have all female papers reviewed only by all female panels. But that's not what the, that's not what's recommended as an intervention. Another would be to prohibit men from participating on review panels at all together. Another was suggested was to anonymize review. There is the sig name sig, these are, are not anonymized review process. So they're getting a signal of gender. Another was to publish open reviews. Uh, another suggestion was to provide reviewers with bias training or to provide them with feedback on how, how their reviews are matching up with other sorts of criteria. Um, which one should we choose? Well, there are, when we have a study like this, we're always, almost always challenged to choose an intervention in this space because in the space of designing better scholarly systems, uh, the outcomes we want are, first of all, they're, par they're, they're noisy. Maybe we can, we can measure um, quality through pre -ex, ex post or ex ante citations, but that's a noisy measure. Um, and it's probably not even a complete measure. There are probably many other aspects of quality that are not at all tracked by that measure, even with some noise. Uh, the observed behavior, um, we're going to be challenged to generalize that to a larger populate interest. This came from three European economics. On the other hand, to, to do this analysis at all, you had to have inside information about how the conference conducted its reviews. So they did not, they, they were not able to go and say, all, all of the conferences give us our records so we can do a random sample of you. So it's a quite, it's a reasonable choice of the sample. Um, and we know that actors will, if we change the rules, actors are going to reflect on the rules, change their behavior, and they may adapt to the interventions. 
and also the underlying mechanisms for how did this get this bias occur. Um, how the historical mechanism could be anything from um, from Matthew effects, where more famous people get um, get reviewed better, and there's some evidence of that, to stereotypes against females, and there's some evidence of they believe there's some evidence of that. Um, but these are also different from the um, the mechanisms that will happen that we can expect to engage if we created an intervention. Because if we create an intervention, we're embedding it in a larger system, and we're going to interact with a, a mechanisms like selection of which conference to go to, or how to evaluate service as a reviewer in your tenure file that are not unwitten, that, that we're not observing here. So what do we, a, a typical intervention, something what, that, that we repeat over and over in our, ourselves is the doink. Um, do it now, check it sometime. And so the design pattern for the intervention, we've seen this, seen this in computer science conferences where, where biases being ripped out. Let's try something to fix this and look at it later. Uh, identify a problem, develop a proposed fix for that, that observed problem, apply it, and then check later to see if the problem got better, which seems really pretty reasonable. Um, and we, in, in the paper, which is not quite publicly available now, um, we, we'll fix that, um, we look at a number of interventions. One of them is the bioarchive, which is uh, a very successful uh, inter preprint intervention in, uh, in biology. Um, and it has a lot of hallmarks of this pattern. Purpose was to accelerate the dissemination of science. What was the intervention design? Well, as far as we can tell, it's documented to select preprints that were not crap, to uh, host a host a preprint server with a nonprofit, target a set of disciplines, and offer tagging on whether they're what kind of paper they are, and and it, and it's successful. There's a lot of things published in BioArchive. Yay. Um, so was the dissemination of science accelerated? And if so, are, are, are scientific discoveries being shared faster than if BioArchive hadn't been there? Are they being, are they being just shared in a different way? Um, are we maintaining the same quality? Did we succeed with that no, no crap design or in not injecting more crap into science? I don't, don't really know that. Um, and even if we did, um, this, there, were, there were a number of different things that happened in that intervention. And by the way, there are a lot of things that got tried along the way as well. And so if we want to say this was successful, we like this, we want to we bring the success elsewhere, what do we do? Do we, do we say we need a well-established organization, we need to target a set of disciplines, that tagging thing was really good. The, the filtering thing, we, it, we don't know. Um, so health and ecology has, um, tells us some frightening lessons about systems interventions. Um, and here's just an example of some. Like in health, um, the frequency of autism spectrum disorders has risen 45 fold in, uh, in about 40 years. It's astounding, right? Um, but we don't know how much of that is due to the change in whatever the biological condition that underlies autism spectrum disorder. By the way, autism spectrum disorder is, not, is still defined as a set of symptoms. But there's, there's, got to, there's some biology underneath it, even though that concept is not yet pinned down. Um, or change in, in, avail in diagnosis um, that there are more available points of diagnosis now, people are looking for it, or change in the definition and diagnostic criteria. Some combination of these changes this, and it, it matters which, but we don't know. Uh, in scholarship, the publication of preprints exposes papers more broadly and in an earlier stage. Uh, but we also see more errors. We see this, we see more retractions of papers. 
are, is it the underlying phenomena changing? Is it the, um, the diagnosis? Is it the definition? Okay. Um, selection and adaption, right? So this is threats to measurement, threats to representativeness. Vitamins make you healthy. Well, especially if like well-off people like to adopt vitamins. Um, select that. That makes, uh, that makes the treatment possibly more attract, look more attractive than it is. Uh, and in scholarship, there's a um, the senior scholars, scholars' reputations, they act differently than, uh, than, than scholars who are not, uh, uh, may have different benefits from systems. And so we may see self-selection and adaption effects there. Um, and finally, another um, in health, um, systems can bite back through a number of different mechanisms, whether adapting by the individuals, uh, a displacement of actors, secondary behaviors, competitive equilibrium. Um, you put in any lock brakes and accidents don't go down, people drive faster. That's not what we expected. You spray DDT and the roofs fall out of the huts because it also kills um, some predators of insects and not some of the other insects that are eating the, that, that eat the thatch in the huts. Or it, you get a later resurgence of the disease because it's very, it is very effective when pushes and the humans are so much are, are, are doing so much better that they push into the jungles and change the habitat. And now the things that were preying on other animals, the kinds of mosquitoes that were preying on other things, don't have any other natural targets, and they come back to humans. Um, so systems can, you know, systems can can adapt. Systems can change in ways that we don't expect. Uh, and we're, we're a, a lot of the the. Um, questions about article publication charges, plan S, and the like, is how do we adapt to this equilibria of we, we created APC charges to make it uh, easier for work to be shared openly, but it's had some unintended consequences. Entrenched in commercial publishers, and some of the, the proposals of ways to prevent free writing also propose to, say, block out countries that haven't paid, which would have a, an effect on access in the global south. So what can the community learn? Well, um, this is, we're probably very provocative and we need to, and we will get lots of feedback. Um, humility in action, doing as science is hard, we have to plan for mistakes. Designing science policy is complex. Uh, which means that there are going to be a number of competing explanations for, for whatever the intervention is. And we, we may believe in one of them and orient our, our intervention for one, but we should be making the evidence better, based better so that it's possible to tell in the long run whether, whether this worked, whether there was some other cause. Um, can we articulate the goals for the interaction? and articulate a model of change for the intervention, right? It might be wrong, but how do we expect this to, to work in, we now have the possibility to affect the ecosystem. And so, in the negative one minute that I have left, uh, I'll we make a, a number of, of uh, recommendations. So there's a huge tension between, uh, in individual projects between doing stuff, getting that intervention off the ground, and, um, and knowing whether it had a larger benefit evaluating it. There's a tension both in time and a tension in, in do you want to show your, your failures to others? Um, and yet, we're in this for, um, for the purposes of making science better. So is it possible for people to learn from not only from your outcomes, from the process, from your mistake, have you made transparency default 
in the intervention itself, and who your editors are, and how long it take, in what the processes of review were, anything that can. Platforms and conveners have more reach. They might be, can they provide design patterns for interventions, develop training, provide more indicators of the health of the scholarly ecosystem. And the, when our, often our projects end before we can see the long-term impacts. But we would like something comparable. And for funders, uh, can we make some of uh, a commitment to at least stating what the the goals are, stating the mechanism of change, the the evaluations, and sharing that evaluations and process part of funded research. For example, can we commit to um, when you have a when you go to Sloan Foundation, etc., make that that proposal and the evaluations of that intervention available. If we have. Hey, everybody. Thank you. And uh, for a little change of pace, on to qualitative. Um, in addition to my co-authors, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Liza Fuentes and Megan Kavanaugh, who contributed to this presentation. I'm going to be talking to you about a collaboration between my institute, the Guttmacher Institute, and the Qualitative Data Repository, in which we took a research project that we're doing at Guttmacher and are using it as a demonstration project to try to advance the theory and practice of transparency in qualitative research, particularly in work that contains highly sensitive data. I'm just going to quickly describe both institutions um, so you know who we are. So since QDR is already a part of the BITS network, I'm just going to remind everyone that they're one of the few repositories dedicated solely to qualitative research, curating it, storing and preserving it, and of course making it available for public use. They're housed within the Center for Qualitative and Multi-Method Inquiry at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse, so they're coming at this from a political science orientation. You might be a little less familiar with Guttmacher. Um, we are a nonprofit that does research on sexual and reproductive health in the US and internationally. We just celebrated our 50th anniversary. We have about 60 researchers and another 60 or so staff in policy analysis and communications. We're most known for surveillance and basic stats on abortion, contraception, fertility intentions. Lately, we've been exploring more complex questions, trying to really understand what's behind the numbers in those domains and using more advanced quantitative techniques to try to get at that. We're striving for reproducibility in our work just like everybody else, but also a little bit for our own reasons. Working on these topics, uh, which are extremely sensitive and politically charged, it subjects us to maybe a different level of scrutiny than some other researchers might face. So not only do we want to adhere to the changing expectations of the larger social science field, we also want to improve our internal processes to avoid mistakes, make as much of our quantitative data as possible available for public use to demonstrate the integrity of our work. Exploring more complex questions also involves expanding our qualitative work. And with that, we became interested in transparency in this domain as well. So I'm looking around and seeing a lot of quantitative researchers. Am I right? Um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to set the stage for a discussion of transparency within qualitative methodologies by giving you a little bit of background on them so we have a bit of a shared vocabulary going forward in the discussion. Qualitative inquiry is a systematic approach to understanding social and cognitive processes. Surveys and surveillance data can tell you what people did, but not why they did it or what it meant to them. Qualitative work is particularly well suited to answering those exploratory questions, to providing nuance and rich description for interpreting phenomena. It's useful for theory building, do your qualitative work first and find out what you should be asking about. It's useful for interpreting or illuminating your quantitative findings by clearing up some mysteries you may find in your data, further exploring associations that you see. It's particularly useful in the field of sexual and reproductive health where the limits of quantitative data can be felt pretty acutely. 
So there are different epistemological uh, approaches to designing qualitative inquiry and also different ways of getting your data. People tend to mix them up, so I'm just going to put this non-exhaustive list of approaches up there. Um, and note that at Guttmacher, we mostly use the phenomenological approach, which means that what we're, we're trying to do is understand our ex respondents' experiences and the meanings that they make of those experiences. Other approaches are things like ethnography, case studies, grounded theory. You also might be really familiar with different modes of qualitative data collection, um, which are the tools that we use to implement those approaches. Um, public health research, like what we do at Guttmacher, tends to use a lot of in-depth interviews with individuals as well as focus group discussions. Other modes could be direct observation, content analysis, things like that. One thing that's common across data collection modes is uh, the open-ended nature of our questioning. We're avoiding yes and no questions. We're going toward really concrete but non-hypothetical questions that people can actually answer um, about their lives and what happened to them. And we tend to do it in a semi-structured or semi-standardized format so we can compare across people. Another thing that you already know, but I'll just mention, is that qualitative data sets tend to have small sample sizes, right? We're not going for statistical generalizability. We're going for other concepts such as um, saturation of themes. The approaches that we use tend to use maybe, I don't know, 20 to 50 respondents, just to give you an idea. Before I get into analysis, I just want to say, well, what is our data then? Our data are our audio files of our interviews and discussions, which we have transcribed verbatim. And then we edit uh, for accuracy and de-identify by hand according to the unique protocols for each study. I mean, of course, most proper names are either taken out or replaced, but there would be instances where we might want to leave some things in. For instance, in a study of barriers to abortion access, we might be leaving in the city and state where the clinics are, where the people are, to give some sense of how far people are traveling. Field notes can be produced and also be considered data, as well as demographic information that we may collect on our respondents. These data are imported into a qualitative data analysis software file, which facilitates the analysis. The software aids us in data management, but it doesn't do analysis. That's done by the researchers. The next step is coding. Qualitative researchers build their observations about patterns and themes from the bottom up, organizing our data into increasingly more abstract units of information. We first develop a set of basic codes, which tend to be very descriptive and concrete. So for instance, in that project on barriers to abortion access, we might have a code for experiences driving or another code for feelings about this abortion. The software facilitates us in labeling the data with these codes, which we add to and refine as we move through all of our data. We work in teams and we continually compare and contrast our coding to make sure that we're doing it as consistently as possible, adhering to the definitions that we've developed and refined. But unlike what Dan mentioned, we're uh, not uh, able to resolve every discrepancy. We can have 40 or 50 or 100 codes um, on, again, um, 50 respondents. So if we get to 90% intercoder reliability, we're happy. So. We may uh, create analytic memos summarizing information for each respondent in a standard format. Once all of our data is coded, we use the software to query it and report on it. For instance, giving us all of the data coded in a certain way. So we might look at all of the information under driving experiences by respondents who live near to the clinics and those who live really far away. We then create spreadsheets called matrices, which help us organize our data and visualize emerging themes. Here's an example. Um, this may involve a little bit of quantification to know which themes are salient to most of our respondents, which may re represent some outlying experiences. This process exposes patterns and connections with if, within and between our respondents and between groups of codes. So these steps and products form a systematized way of digesting, analyzing, and describing the hundreds of hours of discussions we've got on tape, the thousands of pages of transcripts, and provide a trail that leads from that raw data to our findings. So I hope that I've given you a little taste of what qual is and why it's good, but also revealed some aspects of it that make reproducibility, as it's commonly understood, impossible, and transparency 
pretty challenging. I'm going to address whether our collaborative group thinks that it's appropriate, ethical, and feasible to make qualitative research transparent at all, and I'll outline three key aspects of transparency that are suggest suggested by the American Political Science Association and describe how we think they can be fulfilled in qualitative work. Those are data access, production transparency, and analytic transparency. So, like I said, qualitative research can't be reproducible. It's subjective and it is biased. And even if we made our data publicly available, there's no program or do file that we could also supply that could be run on it that could produce our results. The same data is inevitably going to be interpreted differently by different researchers. They're going to pick up on different key topics, even within the same interview. They're going to see different patterns there. But we believe that it can and should be transparent. We may be able to show our data. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. But we definitely can show the methods that we use to arrive at our conclusions so that even if our data can't be replicated, we can demonstrate the processes that produce those conclusions. This allows for the evaluation of the conclusions and strengthens them. So transparency is appropriate epistemologically in that we can show how our understandings and interpretations of our data were formed. We also think, think that it's appropriate when you consider how transparency works as opposed to reproducibility within the research cycle. Reproducibility is really concerned with theory testing, but that's not qual what qualitative work does. Those preceding phases of exploration, hypothesis generation, and theory building, where qual brings the most value, these phases can be made transparent. So if we agree that it's appropriate, we can move on to ethics. And there are a couple of aspects of qualitative research that really do prompt the question about whether it's ethical to conduct it transparently, some of which were touched on by Sean um, in, in what he was mentioning. Uh, the close interaction between researcher and participants, the highly sensitive topics we talk about during these interactions. Now, the question of ethics really concerns itself with one aspect of transparency, which is data access. Simply put, transparent qualitative projects must be able to answer these questions. What data did you use? Where are they? Are they available? And what we've come down to is to say that qualitative researchers must be able to share their data or say why they can't. So what would it take for us to be able to share our data? We need repositories equipped to handle it, and we have some like QDR and others. They're able to host the data and the metadata, and they can add value by potentially helping develop and execute controls that enable researchers to feel comfortable sharing their data without us being the ones to perform gatekeeping. Examples of those controls would be requiring requesters to be affiliated with a research organization, to provide a data security plan and an analysis plan. Now, how would we get our respondents' permission to share their qualitative data? What we use to address data use and confidentiality is our consent forms, which we read aloud to our potential respondents before data is collected. In the past, we've written consent forms for qualitative work in ways that we felt implicitly allowed for data sharing. We said, the information that you provide will be used for research purposes only, and hope that that sort of covered it. Um, but for this demonstration project that's the subject of our collaboration with QDR and the test case for our transparency plan, we didn't feel comfortable with that and decided to make it an explicit opt-in to data sharing. Um, and I'll mention at this point that QDR um, supplies a lot of scripts that people can use for this kind of thing. So this project that we're doing involves highly sensitive data. It's a component of a larger study that aims to measure the extent to which abortion is underreported in nationally representative surveys and to develop and test new measurements for abortion. We'll use cognitive and in-depth interviews, and some of our respondents will have screened in due to having reported having had an abortion in the past. So after they've verbally consented to participate in the interview, we'll ask participants if they consent to sharing their data for research purposes. I'm just going to read out loud exactly what we say to them the what we will say to them the transcript from your interview for this study will be, may be shared with other researchers to advance science and health as noted we will remove or change any personal information that could identify you before the files are shared with other researchers if you do not agree to share your de-identified de data with other researchers you can still participate in the study so they're going to say yes or no to that on a form which we are going to store with their respondent id number no names but at the end of the interview, 
all of our respondents will be asked how they made that decision. What did they think we were asking them? What did they think this is for? And what do they think this is about? And that's going to be part of our data set that we can analyze. So we're really excited about that. Um, the transcripts from the respondents who opt in will be de-identified, which for this study will be removal of all proper nouns and replacement with generic terms. Other de-identified data that we'd like to share by placing with QDR would be our field notes and that demographic information. The PI is not committed to sharing data, however, from this project until she sees if there is any, if anybody actually opts in, um, and how the people who did opt in spoke about that decision at the end of the interview. And she needs to see what the data actually contains. Respondents in this project are not going to be specifically prompted to share details about their own abortions, but they could. Also, individual transcripts could be withheld by the PI if, even if the person opted in, if she felt that the respondent could be doxable by the information if it was shared. So we're trying this out when we collect the data next month. Wish us luck. Um, if these criteria are met, we believe that we'll be able to share data ethically. Onto the question of whether it's feasible to make qualitative data transparent, we still think the answer is yes. I've explained what actions would be needed for data access, but what about um, production and analytic transparency. Production transparency is really about documentation and description, so our plan is to create an archive of documents that describe our study design, including our methodological considerations, full IRB application, descriptions of our data collection, information on interviewers, including our positionality and bias, respondent selection, scripts we employed, all related procedures. In order to achieve, achieve analytic transparency, we'll document and preserve those tools and products that I described or, earlier. Analytic memos, our coding scheme, coded data, queries and reports from the software, our matrices and notes. Finally, we'll create a master document or user guide explaining all the elements of the archive and narrating our process. All of these pieces would be stored in the, reposi the repository alongside the data. So please wish us luck with this project and in developing guidelines for other researchers to use and make their qualitative work as transparent as possible. Uh, my question is for Lori. Great presentation. And um, uh, I, I wonder what um, this debate has been going on um, on sociology a lot about uh, openness and uh, qualitative work. Um, I wonder what interaction you might have had with um, uh, others on the, how this is being received. Um, in particular, there's a, a good markers in the public health uh, sphere, and you're like very um, um, uh, adjacent to positivist research. Um, there are qualitative researchers who are who you know who don't want to be called scientists, but are still part of our discipline. Um, so, do, have you had any interaction, and do you have any thoughts on? Um, the possible linkages or conflicts there? Honestly, we really haven't. Um, we tend to be a little bit sequestered uh, with some other public health organizations, specifically uh, sexual and reproductive health organizations, who I know are doing a lot more qualitative research, but really from a public health perspective, a lot of us are demographers and sociologists by training who are coming to qual from those approaches, like you said, more of a positivist. Um, I personally don't have that much interaction with those others, but I will say even within this aspect of th this type of qualitative research that might be more amenable and find it appropriate to be transparent, it's not happening in those domains. Um, this is not something I hear about at my conferences. It's not talked about by other researchers. You know, when you said, Dan, that your, you know, your coding rubric is going to be available and everyone can scrutinize it. I'm like, it's amazing. Nobody does that um, in, in qualitative research. Um, not yet. Um, data access is still where, where people are at and they're struggling. Yeah. Um, I, I had a question. My name is David Mondra from the Berkeley Institute of Data Science. And I was actually working with some principal investigators uh, who are seeking um, NSF and NIH funding, right? and the issues of open science came up. So this is somewhat related to the question that's asked, what, it, what can be done or what are you doing to integrate your notions of open science with other disciplines? Because an awful lot of government money isn't going to demography and sociology is going to health and um, 
biodiversity and you know issues like that. So what are you doing to get at the table with these other disciplines? Um, from our quantitative team, we're um, publishing our code um, and making uh, de-identified data available. So we are getting you know some of that money. I mean, people can't publish without it anymore, right? Um, so we, um, the qualitative has been more of a challenge, but we don't get that that funding anyway. So. Just sticking with the qualitative uh, theme, I, I, when you were talking about the, the process, I, I found it really a great presentation, and thanks for kind of walking us through qualitative methods. Most of us here are doing quantitative, uh, quantitative work. Um, it really feels like the process of sharing the data isn't really that different in some ways than what we uh, put out. Okay, uh, then, then uh, other data sets that we use, like survey, Data sets. There's you know there's de-identification and and whatnot, but you know I could imagine that uh, the transcripts once de-identified could be shared. The coding that you guys came up with to sort of like you know label certain bits of text with certain themes um, could be shared. Uh, so I, I don't know. My 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 view of it from the outside at least was that. Uh, uh, the barriers aren't that different than the barriers facing those of us who are collecting survey data. Mm -hmm. You know, 20 years ago it was rare to share that, but now it's common. It takes some work to, to de-identify, but at least that was a, an outsider perspective. You may, I, I want to definitely hear your reactions to that about what the differences are. Um, I'm also curious about um, sort of double coding or having multiple people code data and just, again, in, in, in the world you work in, how common is that and, you know, it, could people produce something almost like a reliability ratio uh, around that? Is that common in, in the qualitative work you do? I'm, I'm just curious to learn more about your work. Um, so first on the data sharing, um, I'd like to think that uh, we could get there. Um, and yeah, you can go through and de-identify and take out names and stuff like that. Um, but it gets a little challenging when somebody is telling their full story of their reproductive history, um, including highly stigmatized behaviors. Um, and I'm going to go put that up on a repository and um, anybody can go access that data. And I'm not as concerned about access is what are they doing with it? Um, you know, when I do my work, uh, people may say some things that I know could be really provocative if they were on the front page of a newspaper regarding how they feel about their abortion, for instance. Um, I, I'm not gonna not publish it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna analyze it and put it in context. Um, I need to be assured that anybody else who has access to that data um, is going to do the same. So that's why I think the controls are, are something that's pretty significant for people working in that space. Um, on intercoder reliability, actually the software does um, allow us, we, we double code um, for a while um, and we you know, run queries on it that tell us you know, how concordant or discordant we are um, and we look at them and we discuss uh, places that, that were discordant um, and then we stop because we've got to eventually get through the rest of the data. Um, so we, um, it, it's, it's iterative and uh, discussion heavy, um, but we, we also know that we're never gonna get to 100%, so um, we just kind of make sure we're as close as we can be. Um, thank you very much for very good presentations. Uh, my uh, question is about the IRBs. Now, most of the time, at least in my setting uh, in Africa, uh, is the clinical trials that are always uh, registered. But even, first of all, with the IRB, you have to get uh, a number, and most of the time they'll give you either a letter or something to verify that you've got... Uh, uh, you've got IRB approval and most of the time they'll stamp on the consent forms and all that. But then I've not seen any role or any concern whether these RSCTs are registered with the trial kind of registries. It is something that is done at uh, personal initiative and usually the prompting is because you want to publish this data, 
So the journal will ask the trial registration number. And so most of the time the journals will ask whether the registration was uh, perspectively done or uh, retrospectively done. I'm just wondering whether in your work uh, there was some kind of uh, inquiry about the role of IRBs in registering these studies, and especially even other observational studies apart from clinical trials. It's a great question. Thank you. Um, I'll, say, I'll to contextualize. We focused on the U.S. Uh, regulatory context. So one thing that's come up in conversations is replicating in different regulatory contexts. Knowing that they are compliance offices, it's important to think about. Uh, at, at a minimum, almost like from a Maslow's hierarchy of needs perspective, all of us are asked to do more than we can. So we have to make decisions about what our priorities are. And for compliance offices, it's avoiding non-compliance. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the regulatory context would be in, in non-US IRBs. In this context, um, from the survey data on the Declaration of Helsinki principle for registering everything, that had the most disagreement. But I think there was agreement for, in particular, institutions that have applicable clinical trials. So clinical trials that one would either look for FDA approval on or meet the National Institutes of Health definition for a clinical trial. There was support for checking the registration of studies. And it's typically because um, there, there's increasingly coordination between human subjects offices and clinical trial offices. Like literally checking my email on the break before this, I'm on a listserv where I saw a job advert at an R1 university for a clinical trial specialist in the human subjects office, not in the clinical trial office. From there, I think there are interesting questions about exactly how that's implemented and can that be gamed. And I've heard an example of um, doing an audit of a system that collects these trial numbers that investigators have put in fake numbers to get through the system. So, and then it's caught later on down the road. So being very nitty gritty about how it's implemented is an important question. Um, so I think to move things in this, in this area, a question I'd have and love to chat more about it is, what are the regulatory requirements and who's in charge of making sure a trial is registered? If there is somebody at the institution, and linking that up with the IRB if it's appropriate in that context. 